guest is Jenica Atwin, Green Party candidate for Fredericton or Mukto Fredericton? It's called Fredericton now. Yeah, Fredericton. they changed it. But it's a lot bigger than just Fredericton, oh, yes. right? Yeah. <laughs> How far? Um, so it goes all the way to Burton. Um, it goes to Noonan hmm. in Pepper Creek. It, go, it goes to New Maryland, but cuts off at Charter Settlement. Um, Majorville, Sheffield, Marysville. Hmm. It's it's huge. <laughs> Roughly how many people, how many potential voters do you have? Uh, over 80,000. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you reach all those 80,000? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> well, we've been working very hard. Um, I think our communication strategy is, you know, doing an excellent job, social media, um, emails, phone calls, but the door knocking has been our, our, our main focus and we've really been working hard to get to every neighborhood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. General question, um, campaigns tend to have a traditional approach, but technology has changed so much. Mm -hmm. uh, did you do any Facebook Live or any of that sort of approach to reach a lot of people? We did. Uh, we, we did it a few times, actually. Some some of our just public events, we we, we live streamed. Um, we recently did an event at the Grad House this past week where we were just sitting in a, in a at a booth and had questions coming in from, from Twitter and from Facebook and Instagram, and we were addressing them as they were coming in, so it was a lovely experiment. <laughs> Good. Um, any sense of the audience interaction? <clears throat> I'm thinking of, well, I'll call them trash TV shows. But a lot of these shows nowadays, um, Dancing with the Stars or America's Got Talent, you mm -hmm. know, for the American shows, they'll have an interactive component with the show. So you can Twitter in your vote or you can log in your vote, that kind of mm -hmm. thing. Some shows, they'll even show you the, the dialogue going on, the chat room function mm -hmm. down the side. Mm -hmm. If you did a Facebook Live thing, you'd have the chance to kind of take questions and interact and I know there's some software now that you can rent. I've taken a couple of webinars, and you can interact um, with other people in the webinar. Okay, yeah. Did, did that find its way to you yet? I know it's a bit of a stretch, but mm. one day that's going to be the way campaigning mm. is involved. Well, there'll be a lot less waste and a lower <laughs> carbon footprint for that, so I would certainly be open to that. Um, we have a lot of students that are helping us out a lot with that, so they've been doing some some polling and, and, and lots of interaction through that, those platforms. Um but there's also a risk to that if you kind of allow just the comments to come in. I remember um, running an event with students where we had a, actually we had Wab Canoe come in as a speaker to our school. Um, and uh, we had a live feed of, of Twitter comments as it was going. And there were a few things we had wished we caught earlier. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. But, but that's how it goes, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, you probably have experienced some of that in person too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, do you want to share a couple? What I'm after a bit is media have a traditional pattern of how they will report an election. Mm -hmm. It tends to be like a horse race or a boxing match or something, and it's not. It's, mm. a, it's about democratic decision-making process mm. rather than first past the post. Even that phrase is like not appropriate. <clears throat> and in there, um, they never talk about the voter. They're always focused on candidates, specifically leaders. And so you never get the other half of the relationship, the other half of the equation. Mm -hmm. And many people don't realize this is like a four-week, five-week-long job interview for you mm -hmm. with literally 80,000 people who are your employers who are going to grill you and question you and yes. challenge you and make judgments about you. Mm -hmm. But we never talk about the voters as much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can you share some experiences, what it's been like meeting voters at the high points and some low points, mm -hmm. so that people get a sense of what it's like to be a candidate? Sure. I mean, I'd, I'd have to start off by saying there's far more positive than negative, which has been, you know, lovely. Mm. Um, and really, as I ran in 2018 as a provincial candidate as well, and there was quite a bit more negativity um, during that experience. So it's been very encouraging. Um, and, you know, there's still some, I would say, old-fashioned individuals who had some very prejudiced beliefs. So that's something I've experienced at the door where I really had to you know, put my critical skills hat yeah. on and get them to challenge their, their way of thinking. So, so so the prejudice thing, is it the female thing, the gender stuff? Is it the First Nations, Indigenous, non-Indigenous stuff? Mm -hmm. Is it um, Green Party put in a box 25, 30 years ago and it's still being put in that box? Mm. Well, a little bit of all of that, um, <laughs> but mostly talking about immigration mm. or Indigenous rights. That's really where it's come up because I speak specifically about that and some of the things that I'm passionate about. So... It's been about confronting um, some of that the older ways of thinking, for sure. Hmm. Mm -hmm. High points. Um, well, just I mean, so many wonderful messages come in daily. Um, some really great conversations at the doorstep where people are just 
first of all, very happy that I also talk about things like mental health. It's been a very big, um, you know, issue for me personally, and it's, it's been kind of the flagship of my personal campaign. And so people appreciate that. And so we've had some really intense, deep conversations where I've been making some some great connections with people on a real human level. Mm. And those are the memories that I will take with me, you know, so I certainly won't forget this experience anytime soon. Mm. Um, but some of it also, there's a, you know, when, you, when you're at a tough door, you know, you're there to kind of just talk about politics, like it's, you know, the pleasantries. But when you have those really intense conversations, there's a sense, you know, when you leave that, you know, I, I want to be able to help that person and kind of forget about the rest of the, of the machine that's going on around me. And so at times it's really difficult to kind of, you know, pull yourself out of that. And I've, I've made many calls to our, our local MLA here, David Kuhn, just to, you know, to have some immediate relief for some of these individuals who are really struggling. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the emotional connection. Interesting turn because we objectify politicians again in mainstream media. Mm-hmm. Um, we do it a lot of places, but politicians currently are the flavor of the month mm-hmm. kind of thing. <clears throat> is there a fit or is there room for politicians to be personal like that rather than they will follow a formula, follow a script, uh, present themselves in a certain way in order to get the vote? Um, mm. You're running a certain degree of risk by just being Jenica. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, or has the tide changed enough? Have new people coming to vote for the first time? Or people saying, I'm tired of not voting, maybe I will participate this time. Mm. Is, is there a shift happening in your experience even? Because it's your second time, you've got a provincial one, now a federal one. Mm-hmm. Um, that it's the personal touch that will make the difference rather than vote for me, I'll be in power, I've got a seat at the table, I can get cookies back to our constituency, th- mm-hmm. that culture. I think so. I mean, and there's there's still a, a fair amount of that where people are wondering, what can you do for us? What can you do for me? But that human touch, that emotional connection has really been, for us, what has shaped our campaign. Um, and it's, again, it's, it's following the leadership of other strong Greens who have come before us. So David Kuhn, Elizabeth has a, a fantastic way of really engaging on the personal level with individuals as well. Mm-hmm. Peter Bevan Baker uh, from PEI, he's known for that, just being so present and on the ground level, really being there for his constituents. And that's absolutely my approach as well. I think back also to my my career in education. My students all called me Jenica. I I always made it a very personal thing. I wasn't afraid about being vulnerable because that's how we we really make those those bridges and those connections, and that's how we can move forward on some really tough subjects. Um, mm. And so, when you're when you're working in a position of authority w- with youth, I think that's very important. And I see politics in, in you know at least my approach in politics to be very similar. That it has to be at that very personal level because that's how we're going to be able to really reach each other and understand each other. Um, because we're not all going to agree on things, but we need to find that common ground. Mm. You think voters get that? I hope so. Um, and really, that's what we've been, some of that feedback that we've been getting that's so positive is because of that personal touch. We've had, you know, many people reach out after we've actually knocked out on, knocked on their doors, and they're saying they really appreciated the softer approach, not being pushy. That's kind of a, we've seen that several times. You're going to vote that. for us? Can yeah. we count on your vote? Yeah. And, and people don't like that. They don't want to talk about how they're voting because it's their personal information, and they, they don't have to tell anyone. So we do not ask. We make a point not to ask. We tell all of our canvassers, do not ask someone how they're voting. Um, we certainly will encourage them to vote and they always say no matter who you're voting for please just get out and vote and we'll even we offer transportation but it's never you know with the agreement that you're going to vote green absolutely not so Hmm. we just want a really high voter turnout so that we know that this is what the people want so ethics is showing up as a major theme in the federal election based on a Nick Nanos poll um, three or four months ago but I'm wondering if it plays out for you at the grassroots level, because that would tie to your personal touch, that um, I'm here, this is what I represent, here's what you're voting for, mm-hmm. um, which would be an ethical approach to politics. Mm-hmm. And you're trying not to make that an oxymoron. Yes, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I constantly refer to our platform, which right on the cover it says, honest, ethical, caring leadership. And those are really our fundamental values as Greens. And it's so easy to get behind those because they're, you know, they're so meaningful. And I think we need more of that in our society and in our political sphere as well. And it certainly is coming out. Um, people, again, we talk about my approach and we're getting a lot of feedback on that. I remember being at um, a Stepping Stone Center debate. So it was mostly around seniors issues. And um, a lady at the end, she stood up and she said, give me in one word, you know, uh, my moral compass, compass is... And, you know, ethics is really what it comes down to for me. Um, 
what are we if we don't have our, our principles um, and our ethics? And so, um, so bringing up the SNC Lavalin, um, you know, issue is just to say that a prime minister's job is to withhold or uphold jobs above all else is just not, first of all, the definition of being a prime minister. And I'm, I'm always shocked when I hear that. Um, it's to make ethical, strong decisions um, as a leader for your people. So it's not about, you know, at all costs that jobs are, are the ultimate goal. That cannot be our ultimate goal. And so there's something fundamentally wrong when we start going down that path and we need to bring it back, um, you know, towards ethics and leadership. <clears throat> on the border between Quebec and Ontario, traveling from Quebec to Ontario, they have their billboard, Welcome to Ontario. Underneath it says, Open for Business. Mm -hmm. It always begs the question, for me anyway, that what is the role of government? And you just touched on it a bit. Mm -hmm. There's many who believe the role of government is to protect and empower people. But since the 80s, and New Brunswick, it started with the McKenna era, with this open for business mindset. Mm -hmm. So it's as if the government's role has shifted to simply facilitate business, mm -hmm. which is one of three elements. You know, you've got private sector, public sector, and voluntary sector in a community. Mm -hmm. Should the role of government simply be like open for business like Ontario wants to do, and they even billboard it? You know, mm -hmm. um, New Brunswick used to have 1-800-FRANC, okay. open for business, you know, I'm yeah. thinking. Can, can you speak to how to create that shift? Some of it's the ethical thing. Mm. Um, potential for minority government who knows mm -hmm. how that's going to shake out mm -hmm. but then you got to put it into practice yes do you have any sense even though you're not there yet um what that would look like so then voters yes. would know you know this is the difference rather than it's just an idea mm -hmm. so i mm. mean part of it is reorienting our focus and our measurement of success to be on well-being uh, and that's really a, a, a wonderful goal of the Green Party in particular, but that's something that I've kind of measured my own success on is, you know, you can have all the, the money and wealth in the world, but if you don't have personal well-being, what does that really mean? Uh, I remember seeing Winona, Winona LaDuke, she's an Indigenous scholar, she spoke at the, the Kinsella Hall at St. Thomas a few years ago, and that's what she really challenged the crowd to think about is re reimagine what you think of in terms of wealth. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean you've got stacks of cash. It's it's about maybe you have plenty of healthy food to eat and your your family's mental health is taken care of and there's lots of options for, for cultural expression. And, you know, so that's what I think about when I think of a successful country, um, a successful province, a successful constituency. And so that's really the shift that I want to see. Um, and I think having more female leaders is part of that. Uh, I think just talking about it more and, and kind of challenging that kind of thinking around constantly being about jobs or money and what that really means. Uh, and that's how we're going to kind of lead into this consciousness shift. And with that consciousness shift, we're also going to see more support support for that local economy. And we're going to start seeing a lower carbon footprint. So it, it's all connected. And I think it's just about, again, going back to that leadership element. Somewhere in there is this notion of truth. You know, in our past conversations, we talked a little bit about truth and reconciliation, but you put an extra emphasis on the truth part. Mm -hmm. mm, for you, there must be elements of truth to what you just said about um, building a different economy. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about truth a little bit? Because it, yeah. it's going to get sticky <clears throat> at some point. If you win and you're in, you know, Parliament, <clears throat> and the way media will control the narrative, you're going to be left with, but that's not what I said, or that's not mm -hmm. what I meant, mm -hmm. or, or even what we read nowadays. Mm -hmm. You know, did we get the full truth or the full context of the story, not just uh, for and against the yes. way media tend to report stuff? Mm -hmm. um, can you speak to your personal ideas of, of how you can embody truth as an MP? Mm -hmm. So that makes me think about my, my, my kind of formal training. So I talked a little bit about my master's in education in critical studies. And really a huge part of that is understanding that no issue is a dichotomy. There is no right and wrong. There's no black and white. Um, it's an a, a intermingling of, of many different shades and, and many different opinions and perspectives. And so it's about navigating that. Um, it's about allowing different voices to, to be heard. Uh, I, again, I mentioned we're not all going to agree on things and we, we can't all agree on things or else it would be quite a boring uh, existence. And so it's just about having respect for one another and, and, and being able to find that truth together. Um, because truth, I think, is is, is fluid as well. Um, it depends on, on the time. It depends on who's looking at it and mm -hmm. whose values and whose bias. And, um, you know, I think it's always important to, to question who's going to benefit from certain things. I think that's a, a, it's a, a critical studies perspective in and of itself. Um, and so that's that's part of it. And 
Many of these issues, I don't speak in absolutes in any way because of that training. Um, I know that those absolutes don't exist. And so people have appreciated that approach as well. So they see the platform, they know what the green values are, they know where I stand on, on specific issues, uh, but they also know that I'm willing to listen and to learn and to, to, to change as we go. And that's how we find truth together. Um, and when it comes to indigenous people, I think there's just, you know, there's no refuting the, the past. I think we've, there's so much documentation to, to suggest, um, you know, that genocide has been done in Canada, um, but there's still those who avoid realizing that truth. So we need to push the, the, the truths that we have settled on um, through rigorous research and, and uh, communication and consultation with Indigenous peoples. Um, that needs to be acknowledged. And so there's something to be said about the path to truth and then about acknowledging that truth once we're there. And that's how we get to reconciliation. Somewhere in that, you must have a process in your head. Um, some viewers might be listening to you thinking, well, that's a nice idea, but that'll never happen <laughs> because someone's going to be in power and they're going to impose their power on their decision making. And you're talking in, in you know, the collective conscience, mm -hmm. nurturing that, and which ties to wellness, which would tie to mental health mm -hmm. and food supplies. And mm -hmm. it's also to a process that nurtures that, which gets into, you know, consensus decision making in politics, which is a different beast from the power structure that is the parliamentary system that we're in. Mm. Can those two morph? Can you integrate? Do you think you can integrate one into the other so that you can actually have consensus decision making in a parliamentary setting? Mm, I, I hope so. Um, I think part of that is uh, a stronger emphasis on the committee work and the, the debating process. And I think if we have more respect for one another and we're willing to understand that, that path to truth a little better, and it's, we kind of check our egos at the door, I think that's really what's impeding a lot of the, the progress that we'd like to see from our government. Mm. Is uh, and, and the first past the post system is what breeds that as well. So it's it's creating this system where there's always a group of individuals who are left out and don't feel represented. And so that's going to impede that consensus, uh, you know, finding process that we really should be looking for. We want all of Canada to be happy. I know that's a utopian ideal. And again, there'll be people questioning that. Um, but I think we can at least do better than what we've done, which is this what leads to this kind of pendulum swing that we're seeing. We're always going to have people who are upset if we continue to move in that way. So a collaborative approach, coalition governments, I think are a great idea. Um, there's just so much more we could be doing to, to, to better communicate with one another at that level. Hmm. Let's apply it to a specific. Um, so the Green Party tends to be put in a particular box by the mainstream media. I mean, you guys have tried for 20, 30 years to dig out of that box and mm -hmm. say, no, we're the full male deal. Mm -hmm. We're not just like this one thing, right? <laughs> yeah. and, and one of the key turning points would be our economy. So there's more and more information now, especially through social media, on, on the conversion to green jobs, green economies. Mm -hmm. um, every now and then you'll get a story out of China how they're implementing so much stuff that they're actually a leader now in green technology, even though some storylines will show they still have all their coal-fired plants and they haven't converted yet. Um, media failed to report within 30 years, though, that's all going to be transitioned. Mm -hmm. they, never, they always talk about the specifics in the moment rather than in 30 years, here's the direction they're headed. They've made these decisions in 2010, they're starting to manifest in 2015, 2020, and it's going to be here in 2030. Mm -hmm. Canada has a whole raft of things it needs to change in order to be okay for 2050, 2060. Mm. The world's population is supposed to double by 2047, according to some studies. Wow. You never hear that in the mainstream narrative about Canada with our land mass and our water, mm. and the world's population is going to double. Can you play in that space of what a green economy might look like if there's a coalition or a minority government in Ottawa for the next four years and what you would push for, for what the Green Party would push mm -hmm. for? So a big part of that is, is kind of getting out from the, the thumb of corporations and, and kind of big oil and those have been leading our decision making for mm -hmm. such a long time. Is that even possible? I think it is. I think if we have leaders who are willing to stand up, um, that it's it's definitely possible, especially where I think we're seeing the support on the ground now. We're also seeing consumerism start to shift. So I think if you pitch it to those those kinds of corporations and, and leaders as as an opportunity rather than that we're just kind of shutting them out. And we really want to speak to that as well. It's about transitioning workers who are in that, in that industry as well. So they've got to be part of the puzzle. They're, they're Canadians as well. So it's, again, I go back to that consensus making, you know, they have to be included and their voices do matter. Um, but it's going to take some, some negotiations. It's going to take some strong arming. And I think it's important that they, they realize just what's at stake. And so that it's, it's kind of a, 
almost non-negotiable, but they have to be willing to, you know, to, to work on our terms as, as Canadians and what the people are, are now saying they want with climate change as a top election issue. So mm. that's part of it. Um, it's also just acknowledging, again, um, that we don't have to have economy versus environment as a dichotomy conversation. It doesn't have to be that way. And that was what's been impeding us, I think, that was a provincial issue. I heard that many times at the doorstep. Well, you know, it sounds well and good, but how will you pay for it? Or we still need to have jobs and I don't want to live off the grid and eat only granola bars. People have this kind of concept of what that means to be green and so we've been really working hard to to get out of that box so um, it's not granola bars yeah well i mean i like granola <laughs> bars but, <laughs> but it's just that people are afraid of their lifestyle and their behavior and that they don't want someone coming in and dictating all of the changes that they have to make so it's mm. about making it easier for the canadian people as well mm. so for me it's a, it's really about shifting a lot of the products that we currently use so moving away from oil and gas it's not just about our dependency for our, our, our electricity and our, our gas needs for our vehicles it's about um, how we're using petroleum products so we're there's petroleum everywhere <laughs> um, we, we understand that but I'd like to see more petroleum being used as part of that transition process and there's so many job opportunities in that um, all of the retrofitting that needs to happen across Canada um, in our local constituency or for commercial and residential buildings there's so many job opportunities there for local businesses who are already engaged in that in 2017, there were more jobs in, in wind and solar than there were in the oil and gas industry. So we're already getting there. So it's just about being clear about that information and, and talking about some of that, uh, you know, future projections and showing people that we are on the right path and that we don't have to turn the taps off tomorrow. That's the other thing we hear all the time is that they're not ready for us to turn the taps off, which no one is suggesting that we do that. It's just about leading away from that that dependency because right now we're so dependent and we're going to fall off the edge of that cliff. And in, to ignore that is very dangerous. And so it's, it's information sharing is also a part of that conversation. Buried in that conversation around economy is also autonomy. <clears throat> we, we, the influence from large corporations through oil and gas structures mm -hmm. onto politics with voters who have this, you know, fix it for me now mindset. Because voters need to get into a 50 year mindset, 60 year mindset, and not just a four year cycle as mm -hmm. well. Um, and politicians need to kind of shift their talk like you've just done with we need to think a longer term and more integrated approach. <clears throat> But somewhere in there is the practical, like the grunt stat information on jobs. So if it's a New Brunswick equivalent, mm -hmm. um, pulp and paper generates 20,000 jobs. Uh, how do we convert those 20,000 jobs in a 20 year window to something that doesn't have such a highly negative impact on soil and water mm -hmm. in, in the province? Given that worldwide, that industry is sort of in decline anyway. Mm -hmm. Um, it just hasn't hit here yet. And North America in general tends to be buffered from an awful lot of things because we have space and we have water and, mm. and relatively clean air. And, but we don't have process mm -hmm. yet uh, for decision making. How can we get voters to not vote on a four-year cycle? We always say politicians want to get reelected so they make decisions on a four-year cycle. But voters vote for that. Mm. So how do we get voters to stop thinking that way? Well, I mean, I still want them to see action within four years. And so it, it, in, in some ways, I do want them to, to think about a four-year term because I think more is possible with what, than what we've been seeing out of that, that short period of time. Um, and as we know with, with the warning that we've been giving with, with the IPC report is that we need to act fast. So while I do want to think about future generations when we're talking about our environmental policies or economic mm. policies or even population um, issues, mm. that's important to have that, that, that forward thinking. Um, but we do need immediate action. So it's kind of currently we need to meld the two together. Um, and just to your earlier point as well, something I see in New Brunswick as being a, a, an extremely viable option. We have 93% unused farmland. Um, products such as, as that can be derived from hemp are actually incredibly versatile. We can make pulp and paper out of them. Um, we can make biopolymer plastics out of them. We can make clothing out of them. They're, there's, they're protein. Um, there's, there's lots and lots of... Uh, Hempcrete as well, building materials, yeah, it's was, antimicrobial. I was going to throw that in. If you didn't, <laughs> because worldwide, there's a dilemma with sand. Mm. So everyone's talking about plastic, plastic in the oceans. Like, mm. There's this other one over here that mainstream media isn't catching on to and giving it the three-day, five-day narrative. And because of construction and concrete, mm. um, there is a real issue going on worldwide on sand. In a village. Wow. But you can use hemp. 
and yes. hempcrete instead. Yeah, and hempcrete actually doesn't take power tools to make either. It's very <laughs> low carbon. Um, it's just incredible. And the more I learn about uh, the opportunities with hemp, the more excited I am about that being a New Brunswick opportunity as well. Mm -hmm. um, and even you talked about air quality. Um, a, a hectare of hemp actually creates four times as much as much oxygen as a tree stand. Mm -hmm. um, it can take heavy metals out of the soil and make it more viable for, for farmland and a future purpose. So it's just incredible. And it's been around for thousands of years. I mean, just moved away from some of the knowledge that that has you know has, has come before us and so that's part of that conversation is going back to some of the old ways you know we, we've kind of had this great hubris as as human beings and uh now we're a little too close to the sun and we've got to back it up and think rethink how we've been doing things the answers have always been there nature always provides we just have to be more respectful of that relationship and uh and, and move forward in that way what are the key things going on in your constituency that you hear about Climate change, healthcare. Those are, every time I'm at a door, those two subjects come up, um, which is very encouraging. I'm very excited that we're, we're all on the same page when it comes to this climate emergency, finally. I think the flooding in Fredericton has really led people to believe that this is an issue that affects them. It's no longer in someone else's backyard. It's in their own basements. Um, so that's been something that's really started to come up. But healthcare in New Brunswick, you know, as it should be a top election issue, we have, uh, you know, very unique de demographic challenges that are, are far, um, far worse than the rest of the country when it comes to our, our mental health outcomes, when it comes to certain uh, diseases that occur here. Multiple sclerosis is, is, is very high. We have very high cancer rates. Um, our aging population is much higher than the rest of the country. So we've got to address th those demographic needs. We need more money coming into the system. We need a more community-based approach. Um, we need to empower our, our physicians and our nurses uh, to not only work within their capacity, but to have a our larger voice in, in shaping some of the changes that they want to see. They have the solutions. When I speak to nurses or doctors, um, they're they're excited to tell me, you know, the plans that they have that would alleviate some of these issues like wait times or or lack of beds or nurse shortages. So these, the solutions are there and they usually always are. If you just have to go and talk to people on the ground and empower them. And so that's really what we need to focus on here. And, and that's what I'm talking about, that four year turnaround. We must fix our healthcare system in New Brunswick. And that's going to affect our environmental outcomes as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think we could get a population to eat better? The shortest turnaround to lower health care costs is to have a healthier population. Mm -hmm. Yes. But people don't seem to take on the personal responsibility of taking care of the bodies. They want the health care system there when they're in their 60s from a lifestyle from their 20s to their mid 50s. Mm -hmm. Can, so can a... we get at them? Because that would be a huge breakthrough. Mm -hmm. That's so... For me, I look at as another behavioral change, which is very difficult to go right into someone's psyche or their home yeah, and say, this yeah. is what you need to do. And as a government, I don't think we should really be going there, but we can make it have an influence. So I'm thinking about schools. I think children should be fed in schools. It should be part of our system. And there we can kind of control what they're eating for at least breakfast and lunch and snacks and make sure that it's healthy, um, make sure that it's local as well. Organic would be lovely. Um, our hospitals, um, any of our, our, our big business buildings as well, they're, they're, they're catering a lot of their lunches. And, and so I think it's just using that opportunity to really start guiding some, some better healthy eating choices and, and without having to go down to that, uh, you know, very personal dictation of what people should be doing. So there's a way to do it. Mm. Um, and I think, again, it also, if we're thinking about feeding kids in schools, that the educational outcomes will also go through the roof. There's so much research to suggest that healthy food has a major impact. Um, just having a breakfast is, is a big thing. So um, we also have to talk about poverty in this province. Um, and, and really when schools were going to ban the juice and the, the chocolate milk and I just didn't think see that as in any way going to have an impact on you know obesity rates or, or, or health rates in the province because there's a poverty issue and when you're putting extra pressure on the, again that individual to have to go out and buy that very expensive food and to be very critical of the lunches that kids are bringing to school and that kind of there's a lot of shame that's associated with that and I don't think that's the right way to do it and also um, having worked in a resource room for for students um, many who are at risk or who have you know food insecurity Really, if they're going to have anything else that day, if I can get them chocolate milk, I know it's filled with a little bit of sugar, yes, it's, <coughs> but it's got protein and it's got it's going to get them through the day. And if that if, if I can provide at least that one thing, I like to have that opportunity and not just mm. water. <laughs> Water's wonderful. We all need to drink more water. Um, but certainly, if, if I can provide a little bit of nutrients from something like that, then that's what I'm going to do. There's a potential for circular thinking with all of that. Mm -hmm. 
if we can shift the 93% of the farmland not used, mm -hmm. if we can put it into local food systems, hospitals, yep. um, senior care homes and stuff, and if we can create a culture, New Brunswick used to have three Fs for their identities, forestry, fishing, and farming. Mm -hmm. We know the forestry and fishing pretty good. The farming ones disappeared. Mm -hmm. So when you said old is new again, or mm -hmm. we're coming back, maybe we go back to our provincial identity. I'm trying to weave together that there's a window here that New Brunswick can craft its image or its, its culture. When building a team, um, the first two or three weeks of a team, is when they start to form their, their identity that year. Yep. You've got your characters, you've got your role players, you've got your stars, you know, you got the up-and-comers. Mm -hmm. No different for a province. Mm -hmm. And maybe somewhere in there we can craft something greater than just New Brunswick, the pass-through province. That it's the, the little province that could sort of, because mm -hmm. they're so small and we got to act together quickly on thinking 2050. Yes. Yeah. Do, do you see any of that kind of pattern? It's sort of a vision thing, but then you could crank it right back to tomorrow mm -hmm. and what needs to be done tomorrow to make that happen in 2050. Yeah. That actually gave me goosebumps because I'm so <laughs> excited for those opportunities. And you're right. It is about our identity and who we are. And I think having those conversations mm -hmm. will also help us with all of these kind of existential issues that we've been facing. Mm -hmm. um, and Yes, I mean, I would love to see local local farms feeding into that system that I was talking about. Um, I also think of job opportunities. And, and that's so let's think about mm. some of the issues that came up during the provincial election, maybe about the language barriers. But if you're if you're tilling fields in the farm, it doesn't really matter what language you're speaking. You're, you're speaking the language of the land. And so for many, many people, we could start advertising here are these jobs. And you're going to see droves of people who are looking for that kind of work. It's very satisfying. Mm. Um, it's meaningful. They can see, you know, you know, just from the beginning to end of how a seed to to a vegetable or to whatever their product is it's just an incredible thing and it goes back again to our education system you know introducing this to children at a, at a much younger age and talking to them about the realistic possibilities and having that as a career as well um, and pointing to all those impacts that they could have so mm. we got to get excited about this transition and i think that's really easy to do if we're, we're open-minded and willing mm. um, and you know, whatever happens in this October 21st election, if they vote green, that that tells me that we're ready for that shift. And so we can kind of go full speed ahead. <clears throat> the UK recently did a study on um, larger social issues for their country. And they found loneliness was the number one mm. issue. And they created a ministry of loneliness. Wow. <clears throat> which is an interesting way to approach it because that's a top-down approach to something that's mm -hmm. more kind of grassroots. But at least it's caught attention and at least it's calling for some sort of action or yeah. some sort of intention. Mm. When you talk about mental health issues um, and seniors and our aging population and such, um, do you think we'll wheedle it down to a simple word like loneliness one day instead of all these demographic studies and stuff? Because it resonates mm. for people right away. Mm. They feel whack loneliness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the number one killer in the UK is loneliness for seniors because some of them go weeks without talking to someone. Yep. New Brunswick hasn't done those studies yet, but chances are pretty good out there. Uh, it's yep. a mental health issue. It's a community issue. Mm -hmm. Do you think politics has a role in that somehow? Or is it up to the community to get its act together? Hmm. I think that uh, it takes both. I mean, that's kind of a simple answer is that we have to have that community level approach because it is such a personal issue and it's very individualized. Hmm. Um, but I think you also mentioned that at least it's, it's caught some attention if you if you put that kind of a spotlight on it. So hmm. um, I just hope to be again as a representative, at least a strong voice, um, but we need action associated with that. So um and, you know, isolation and, and loneliness are absolutely, I think, top issues for our senior population in particular. But when we're talking about mental health um, for other demographics, it's much more complicated. Um, and there's a lot of traumas, I think, that we really need to start. That's that truth part again. We need to talk about what is the real issue here. Uh, and a lot of people have different theories. But to be honest, from being on the ground and being someone who has had many individuals kind of disclose what has happened to them and to really uncover the root of that trauma. Mm. Um, there's a lot of unconfronted truths in our society. And a big mm. one would be um, the prevalence of, of sexual abuse actually that occurs. And that to me is really leading a lot of our addiction issues, uh, a lot of our mental health issues. And that's also fueling our homelessness crisis. So mm -hmm. 
that's a conversation we need to get a lot tougher on having. And I know no one wants to go there. Um, but again, having been the person to, who has been disclosed to so many times and having to navigate the system and find the, find the proper channels to find the, those individuals help. Um, I've seen the, the positive aspects when, they, when, when you do come to terms with that and that you can start that healing process. So it's a much bigger conversation. Absolutely. Yeah. Mental health, like food, becomes one of those touchstone topics that then integrates all the other layers and levels mm -hmm. instead of getting caught up in all those details. Yes. You can just wheedle it down one more layer and you'll find, men if we had better mental health approaches and a wellness strategy, mm -hmm. then you would have better performances at work. You would have better performance. If you want to call it performance, yeah. I hesitate on performance, mm -hmm. but because nurses suffer from a certain level of stress and so yes. they've got a lot of days that they miss and in the media cover it three months later that oh in this particular workplace there's all this absenteeism well mm -hmm. it, it didn't happen in a vacuum you yeah. know there was a reason for it but drilling down enough to find that core reason mm -hmm. you know did you eat today and are you happy <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> pretty yeah. basic things <clears throat> let's slide a little bit to um to, to Ormocto and the base, because I know that's mm -hmm. a connection for you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a large employer in our area. It's a federal responsibility. And and uh, you want to speak to um, to some of that and mental health for, for you know, PTSD survivors. Mm -hmm. and, and, I mean, it was just in the news the other day about um, Veterans Affairs did something that didn't sit well with, with mm -hmm. soldiers and retired military. Yes, yep. So... Being from Ramukta my whole life, there's obviously, you know, a lot of pride associated with our, our servicemen and women and uh, with CFB base Gagetown just in general. Um, my father worked for the base, so we weren't a military family, so we got to stay put, which was really great. So we've seen a lot of the, the transition, a lot of the people coming in and out, and we really had a good grasp for some of the issues that come out of, um, you know, your time in the military. Um, and yeah, my family members as well who are, you know, who have served. Um, and it's just, it's... It's a combination of our identity, so it's who we are, and it makes me think about what, one of the main reasons I'm so proud to be a Canadian was this kind of all the peacekeeping efforts we were used to hearing about, but we've known um, that our, our military structure has, has shifted slightly on the world stage and that, that we're exposing our, our servicemen and women to different scenarios than they had maybe been prepared for. And so we've got a lot of this PTSD that we're, we're seeing in our, in our communities. Um, there's also, I have to mention, the, the malaria medication that's recently been in, you know, investigated for potentially increasing the risk of, of PTSD. So that's a very serious issue. And so I, I need to learn more about that as well. Um, mm -hmm. But it's just we need to provide better supports. And we also need to ensure that while they're serving that they have the supports that they need within before they get out. So a lot of this is just kind of a, a reactive approach to maybe something that had been brewing for quite a while. Um, and people need to be able to, to feel heard and they need to be able to, to navigate the, the Department of Veterans Affairs. And I actually I fielded a phone call recently from an individual who was um, from the Métis Nation in Manitoba, but currently living in New Brunswick. And, and also the role of Indigenous uh, veterans and how that's kind of looks different to, to, to others. Um, and it's really, again, about clarity of information. So we constantly hear, you know, this dichotomy again of you know what we're willing to do for veterans versus our immigrants or you know and it's, it's pitting a very negative you know uh conversation around these, these these two very different groups and very different conversations that don't need to be brought into the same category so um we need to be much more supportive of our of our men and women who are serving but specifically with what the truths are again and what's really happening and i think that's going to help um for those who are dealing with ptsd to really have those more those open conversations um I'm not answering this one very well. No, it's not no, coming it's out the way I want to. Yeah. No, it's okay. Um. <laughs> well, we'll shift gears and then you can come back to it if okay. you want. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I hate him calling them third party. So NDP or Green Party or any of the others yeah. will be, you know, well, you guys don't know how to pay for it. Mm. And we'll get into the money part because you've got some pretty strong ideas about where solutions should be. Mm. So just for the rigor of the interview, mm -hmm. um, can we attach dollar figures to that? Or where I want to go is an awful lot of this stuff can happen, these changes that you're envisioning, without spending any more money. Mm -hmm. If anything, it will create um, efficiencies in systems because there's more interconnectedness. Mm -hmm. And I'm leading a, a little bit w with this. But I'm thinking, okay, so if these doctors and these nurses know what the solutions are to the and the administrators too. And, and if a community knows, here's the solutions for food strategies for, for but somewhere out there, if some voter's going to go, oh, you pine this guy greens, you're just thinking, oh, we'll do this, we'll do that, and you haven't got a clue how to pay for it. Mm -hmm. 
So in your platform, is everything costed out? And in your platform, are there even some things that won't cost any money and will create a huge change? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So first and foremost, it is costed, which is really great. Um, we also ran on a costed platform provincially, so it's just kind of a bragging rights, I think, for any of us uh, um, who are the representatives. Uh, and that's something we get all the time at the door is, well, this sounds great. How are you going to pay for it? So it's about having that, that you know, the, the evidence and the numbers to show, you know, we've, we've done the, the necessary research. Mm -hmm. we, we know what it's going to cost. We actually plan on paying down the deficit as well and, and balancing the budget in five years people are surprised to hear that from green so we're not always thought of as being very fiscally responsible yeah. do they um, believe you they do yeah i mean because i i'm, I'm speaking to them in, in a in a way that uh, they trust so we've kind of built that that relationship at the door and people are really appreciative that we've we've taken it that far and that we do have those numbers um so you know people we were talking about pharmacare as an example. We've costed it. It's between twenty-seven and thirty-one billion dollars, and seems like a lot. But to invest in our in our in our healthcare system in that way, and it actually is going to cut costs uh, in the end on in certain health outcomes. Uh, and if you speak about it in those terms, kind of a cost-benefit analysis, people are willing to listen. And so that's always the challenge of greens is is, is showing that we're. Uh, not pie in the sky. And I've actually been um, <coughs> called that by the other candidates in debates, you know, well, this pie in the sky thinking. And I think that's just a distraction uh, it's a tactic. Dismissive. Yeah, it's a dismissive exactly. tactic. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what I've been seeing um, in this riding about the rhetoric of, of this kind of three-way race. Often we're left out of that conversation, even though the numbers are clearly showing we're, we're polling very mm -hmm. strong. Again, whatever weight you want to put on polls. But we've been dismissed. And I think that that's um, a mistake to, to not count us into this fight because – on the ground, the appetite is there and people do want that change and they are listening and they do like that we have the numbers to back up what we're saying. Because the other side of that conversation from the dismissive point of view, all well, you guys are just pie in the sky, is that we'll look at the mess we're in after 40 years of the other model. Mm -hmm. you know, And the world has changed. That's something that never seems to surface enough. Um, mm. the, the world has changed. It's not the same place it was in the 60s and 70s, uh, which built kind of the premise that we're still working under. Mm -hmm. The open for business model or corporations and governments have to get together for the well-being of people because money trickles down. It doesn't trickle down. It mm -hmm. gets stored off somewhere. Theory. So we've got a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. How do you want to end this out? Wow. Um, I mean, so we've talked a, about a lot of things, which is really great, and some and gone down some, in some um, subject matter that we haven't touched on before. So it's really nice to have that uh, mm -hmm. opportunity to speak to some of those issues, um, and just to prove again that we we have a, a well thought out plan, a well balanced plan, and and we're not just a uh, speaking only about environmental issues because we see everything as being interconnected, and that's what's key about greens, and so being very strategic in our approach, being very honest um, and, and transparent. That's what we really want to bring to the table as Greens. And people are ready for that. They're willing um, to, to, to vote for that this time around. And so we're so excited to see what's going to happen um, October 21st. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you for watching. We'll put links in the copy section when we post it up on YouTube and on the website. Um, if you like the work we do, uh, please go to dennisreport.ca and click PayPal or Patreon. Be good. Have fun. Love each other.